Hello everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Stranded, a playthrough in which I unlock the entire tech tree in Kerbal Space Program, which you can see before you. This is the current status of our tech tree. So we've kind of got all of the cheaper nodes unlocked, but now we've got to get all the expensive stuff, including things like the nuclear engine and the really big heavy rocket parts. Now the, uh, the, the twist with this series is that every episode I have to rescue a Kerbal from a planet or moon. Uh, but at the moment, I've not had any notifications of a Kerbal being stranded. I mean, I can check the tracking station, but I don't think... What? There is an untitled spacecraft on the surface of Juna. I've not been to Juna yet, so I didn't leave it there. Who is, who is this here? Let's just zoom in and have a look, see what we can see. It's just uh, Our satellites have got really good cameras. We can zoom really close to the surface of Juna and... Oh my goodness. It's a stranded vessel with an SOS sign painted to the side with a hapless Kerbal trapped inside the capsule. <gasps> what a what an unforeseen set, set of events. Let's just roll the intro. <laughs> So in order to get to Juna, we need two things. We need a rocket capable of getting there, and we need to be launching at a Juna transfer window, which I've just time warped to. Basically, you all know this by now, but in case you knew, a Juna transfer window is if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to Juna, the angle that line forms at the sun should be about 45 degrees. Now, I haven't like done this properly. I've just guessed just by time warping and, and stopping at a point where it looks about right. You can use uh, either the built-in alarm clock feature of Kerbal Space Program, which I've actually never used, uh, or you could use like the website transfer window planner. But honestly, I find that just eyeballing it works well enough. <laughs> and I'm very lazy. But yes, earlier you may recall I said you need two things to get to Juna. You need to be launching at a Juna transfer window, and of course you need a Juna-capable rocket, the latter of which I am now constructing. I'm building it fairly quickly because The Stranded isn't really meant to serve as a tutorial series. I have done extensive Juna tutorials before, so I'd recommend just checking those out if you need some help actually getting to Juna. This video is going to be a bit more relaxed, a bit more fast-paced, uh, especially for kind of the more mundane stuff like the construction process. So I want to show the construction process because I think a lot of people say they like the build time lapses but I'm not gonna dwell on it too much I'm not gonna play the footage back uh, all of that slowly one thing I'm trying is I'm um, speeding the footage up much faster than I normally do but then trying to move the camera as little as possible during the build uh, what do you think of this sort of style is it kind of weird is it better I don't know or do you not have any strong opinions either way let me know your thoughts down below but as you can see the rocket is pretty much done as you can see this rocket is an Apollo style rocket in that we have a separate lander that's going to go down to the surface we've got a double stack lander cam because of course we need to have our pilot Matt Kerman go down to the surface and we need obviously a space for the stranded Kerbal. Whoever that may be, maybe it's a notable famous person. That's always been the case so far. We've rescued Marcus House from Minmus and we've rescued Everyday Astronaut from the Mun. Spoiler alert if you've not seen those episodes. <laughs> but uh, who, who, who is it going to be this time? We'll have to just, we'll have to just wait and see and not fast forward through the video. That would be a spoiler as we do a magnificent zoom in and boom, we light those engines up there. Uh, I don't think there was anything else I really wanted to say in addition to what I've already said about this rocket, I guess. Obviously in The Stranded it's a science playthrough and as you saw from the beginning we haven't unlocked a lot of the tech tree yet so we were a little bit limited in the parts we could use, namely there's no nuclear engine on board this ship. The previous episode of Yep, let me try that sentence again. The previous episode of The Stranded saw me go to deep space to try and farm a little bit of extra points in order to get the nuclear engine to facilitate interplanetary missions but I, I failed to gain enough science so that mission was completely pointless to be honest so we're gonna have to make do with what we got i'm using the making history parts the 1.875 diameter parts i think uh we're using the cheetah engine which is a pretty efficient engine for you know vacuum stuff like stuff in a vacuum so uh it, it's it's pretty good and as you can see the rocket's not that big and cumbersome so we didn't really lose out much by not having the nuclear engine available to us and uh yeah that far that first core stage there is nearly finished burning out and then we can deploy it i wish i could have used separatrons to kind of separate the stages a bit more cinematically is that the word <laughs> um they're not necessary it just looks a bit more epic but unfortunately i do not have the separatrons uh, unlocked just yet that will change at the end of this mission i'm hoping to get about 2000 ish science points from this flight 
That tends to be my goal when doing an interplanetary mission for this sort of mission, which is probably, to a lot of you might be thinking, that's kind of low for a Juna mission. And the reason for this, and I have said this in previous episodes of The Stranded, but in case you've not seen those episodes, the reason is I'm kind of nerfing how much science I can really get from a planet or moon because... Uh, I kind of want to make give this series as much longevity as I can and if I was just going for maximum science I mean I would have unlocked the entire tech tree by this point because you can unlock the entire tech tree just by going to the Mun and Minless so I thought the rule is I'm only allowed to get science from one biome of a planet or moon and I can only kind of get it from like one place so I can only get it from like space near to Duna and space high above Duna I can't get it from like space above the Midlands space above the Highlands etc things like that if that makes sense so the science point we're going to aim for is space high above Duna space near to Duna Duna's upper atmosphere Duna's lower atmosphere and the surface of Duna in the particular biome that I happen to land in we're not going to do any biome hopping even though this lander does actually have enough delta v to do biome hopping I always tend to put in a bit more fuel than I need for rescue craft because I'm trying to aim for a specific landing zone so I kind of needed a bit of extra fuel to fine-tune my trajectory now blink and you miss it it's already gone but I deorbited that lower stage I, I did my orbital insertion using that skipper engine stage but I didn't want to leave it stuck in orbit think of the solar bears after all so I deorbited it I put a little probe core on it just so I could deorbit it I guess I could have fitted some parachutes to it but I feel like whenever I do that it sort of breaks the flow of the video a bit because it kind of cuts away and we just watch a booster parachute down and we have to awkwardly fade back up to be in orbit so I'm like let's just we'll leave it we'll just deorbit it it's fine the stranded aerospace, you know, the world's first strand type aerospace company is being bankrolled by Laun Aerospace. Um, so, so we can easily afford expendable, fully expendable stages. And now we're just doing our um, Juno transfer. I kind of did that very quickly, didn't I? Um, Juno transfers for me are quite second nature because I've done so many. So don't get disheartened if it takes you a little bit longer to get a Juno encounter from low carbon orbit. Basically, just drag the maneuver node out until you intercept Juno's orbital line and then just grab like the center of the maneuver node maker like so you can move it around. And just basically move it around your orbit until you get those nodes as close as possible, like the gray encounter nodes, and then just play around with the prograde retrograde. You'll eventually get an encounter, but it might take a little while. Now, I usually recommend not, like, you can get a really good junior encounter. Like, you see my uh, maneuver node line here, the predicted orbit here. You can get an orbit that close from a maneuver node at low curb in orbit. But I just find, in my experience, when I do the burn, it never, ever works out to be that accurate. It always ends up being massively different. So I generally just try and get any encounter and not put too much thought into what the encounter looks like. And then we'll just do a mid-course correction burn to get the final orbit that I want. Now, if this were a regular, normal Juna surface mission, I would be aiming for an equatorial orbit here. The reason for this is because, as I stated earlier, this is an Apollo-style mission in that we have a separate lander. And it's much easier to get your lander can reunited with the command vessel in orbit if if, both, if you're aiming for an equatorial orbit, basically. You haven't got to faff around with normal and anti-normal vectors. But in this case, obviously, we are doing a very specific mission. We're aiming for a particular object on the surface. So we're going for a tilted orbit. It means that at some point we're going to be passing directly over our target and uh, makes it a bit easier to get the encounter. We haven't got to do any expensive inclination changes in low Duna orbit. Speaking of low Duna orbit, we are about to... Uh, enter it like we're, we're passing over it right now but we're still going to leave its sphere of influence but now we're doing a retrograde burn and we're captured uh, now you, i could save a lot of fuel by doing an aero break here but aero breaking is for noobs the pros all use uh engines <laughs> and by doing it this way if it turns out you didn't bring enough fuel with you you can then just gain a bunch of free fuel by doing an aero break when you initially planned to do an engine deceleration so there you go no reason not to really uh, no, I'm, I'm, I am being facetious here. There's nothing wrong with doing aero captures. Uh, do what you want. Do whatever you find fun. I find this way a little bit more fun. Anyway, uh, there we are. We're, we're in orbit, so now we're going to begin our Duna descent. So all we're going to do is set uh, the untitled spacecraft as our target, and then just time warp around. This is one of the benefits, like I said, of being in a tilted orbit, is we can just wait until we're literally just passing directly over it, and then all we need to do is burn directly retrograde, and we can really easily get an encounter. We don't have to do too many inclination changes, although that being said, it does look like we are going to have to burn uh, along the normal uh, along the normal vector, like the, the pink triangle, a tiny bit just to get our inclination perfect. Just doing a couple of little puffs there, just to get our our our, um, our vector 
spot on. I mean, I'm, I'm just eyeballing this. I did do a couple of quick saves and quick loads to get the uh, encounter spot on. So uh, I didn't actually get this on the first attempt. So don't be disheartened. Don't wonder, like, how, how did Matt get it so accurate? It's because Matt sort of used quick saves in order to get the encounter as good as possible. Uh, there's me making a quick save there, in fact. So, yes, uh, there is the uh, untitled spacecraft there. I um, looked about the right time to deploy some parachutes. But then I'm like, no, we need to decelerate a bit faster. So I deployed the main chutes a, uh, a little bit earlier than they would have deployed normally. And I think it's fair to say that that's a pretty good... Oh, actually, on the map screen it looks pretty good, doesn't it? But in uh, real life, like the third person screen, looks like we could be a little bit closer. So what I'll do is I'll just land and we'll make an assessment. And at this point, I realized, oh yes, I need to be doing science, don't I? So uh, I forgot to get science from space near to Juna and from space high above Juna. Not the end of the world, we can do space, science from space near to Juna once we've, you know, re-entered orbit, but we won't be able to do any science from high above Juna. So if and when I ever do an Ike mission in the Stranded, we can, uh, we can grab some science from space high above Juna then. And here we are coming to touch down. Now we don't actually need to use the engine at all to touch down with these parachutes, we're going at a safe speed, but I thought for realism's sake, let's just try and touch down a bit slower. But there we are. Now, at the moment, we are 1.3 kilometers away from the stranded vessel. So we've got a couple of choices here. My first thought was like, this is fine. We can just use the Kerbal EVA pack to, you know, jetpack our way over. But when I tried, I couldn't get off the ground. Have squad made changes to either Juna or the jetpack or the weight of Kerbals or maybe and something else? I'm not quite sure, but I couldn't get the Kerbals to take off at all. So my choice is either literally just waddle all the way over, which would have taken absolutely ages, or just uh, hover the lander can uh, to be a little bit closer to the stranded vessel. And as you can see, I picked the latter, and luckily everything was fine. I did nearly run out of electric charge, and as you can see, I suddenly noticed, oh wow, I've got like no electricity left. So I um, managed to touch down just in the nick of time, we got those panels deployed, and now the, uh, the lander can start recharging, and we can gather some data from the experiment bays. You may notice that quite frequently in these missions, I will go on EVA, right click the lander cap, well the capsule, uh, click take data and then immediately store the data again. The reason for this is because that allows you to do multiple crew reports. Think of the lander can as being like the science junior. You need to take the data before you can run the experiment again is effectively what you need to do. And there we are, surface sample taken, our flag is planted, and we'll just knock on the lander can, see who's trapped in here. Wait a minute, creative director of the 2023 video game Kerbal Space Program 2, Nate Simpson? Is that you? Oh, is, is, that, is that you, Matt Lown? A uh, noted streamer? <laughs> it, it is, but what are you doing on Duna? Shouldn't you be like in Seattle developing Kerbal Space Program 2? Well, I was told that I should do more research in KSB1. So I was, uh, someone told me there was a face somewhere around here and I was trying to find it. And then uh, as usual, I forgot to, uh, pack enough fuel to go back home. So I I've been hoping somebody would come down here and pick me up. Wait, 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 wait. So is is this the real reason that Kerbal Space Program 2 has been pushed back from 2019 because you've been stuck on Duna this whole time? I mean, I've been here for, I mean, I've lost track. I, I put hash marks all over the side of the capsule, but uh, I, I feel like it's been several years at least that I've been down here. So it, it would have been nice oh, if you came a little no. bit earlier. I've been waiting a while. Oh no, I knew I spent too long talking to Tim on the way back from the Mun. Well, listen, it is fortunate that I am here now to give you a lift back. I've got a spare seat in the old lander can over there, oh, so I can get you home no problem. What a relief. But, but, as payment, can I ask some questions about KSP2 that have never been asked or answered before? Well, I mean, keeping in mind that I've been stranded here on Duna for the last couple of years, I, I right, can certainly this is gonna guess. Be I'm gonna- this is exclusive, I'm gonna get some exclusive insider. I've got some questions prepared for in case this ever happened. Alright, so, um, my first question, I think, is a big one. Um, can you make the Kerbals wear different hats? Um, how would they fit inside the helmets? Well, you, you, ask, you ask me, this is my question. Okay, so we'd have to come up with a system for making helmets that are procedurally larger than any hat that you could put on the Kerbal? That might be kind of cool. That sounds- Interesting, interesting. Okay, okay. Uh, what is Jebediah Kerman's favorite sandwich and why? Um, well, I assume it would be a snack sandwich because he's well established as being a fan of snacks. That's, but that's too ambiguous. I need specifics, Nate. This is important. Um, I think the people are listening. It's a great question. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, I feel like the revelation of the truth is going to shake the KSP community to its core. So I I'm going to say nothing. Oh, ooh, very, very interesting. All right. Next question. So in KSP multiplayer, big feature. 
Will you be able to play as Luigi? <laughs> um, that's a that's a great question.、Um, you may want to reach out to our friends in、uh, in Japan to see if they're on board with this as well. <laughs> All right, so interesting. So that's a that's a maybe that one. <laughs> I don't know if I can officially issue maybes. <laughs> Maybe with so many asterisks that they go off the edge of the page. All right, and I guess、uh, a big question as well is: Will it be better than Among Us? You know, Matt, I, I feel like you've crossed the line.、Uh, this is inappropriate, and I am going to still get inside your vessel,、um, but I'm not going to talk to you the whole way back to Kevin. This is you're acting pretty sus. Is it? Is it? Is it going to be better than Among Us? I, I, again, I'm. I, I have no more to say to you. Well, oh well, well. It seems like that was Nate Simpson. Everyone, there we go. <laughs> anyway, I, I think our、um, our time on Juna is done. We've got everything we needed. We've rescued creative director of Kerbal Space Program Two, Nate Simpson. I have gathered all the science I can gather. I'm repacking the parachutes here, not because I need them again, but just because in my mind they they just look more aerodynamic. Even though I'm like a hundred percent certain repacking the chutes does nothing to their aerodynamic properties, it just looks better. I, d- I don't know. Anyway, we're going to set the command、uh, vessel as our target, and then we're going to return to it. Great commentary as always. Do remember to like the video, guys, and、uh, check out my Patreon and channel membership schemes if you're enjoying this so far.、Um, <laughs> so tacky, isn't it? Okay, let's just、uh, retract those solar panels, re- retract the ladder, and take off. So we're going to aim for just the 90 degree vector, and then just flick. Uh, to the map screen in a second, and just sort of see how we're doing, and eyeball it from there. There isn't really any secret trick that I'm using, other than just you know practice and experience, I suppose. Though I still don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to Duna Ascent. I don't really know what the efficient way of doing things is. I just tend to get off the ground, make sure I'm first of all clear from any mountains or craters, etc., and then I just sort of point 45 degrees. Until the atmosphere gets sufficiently thin, and then just start, you know, flattening out from there. But I basically spend most of the ascent pointing 45 degrees, which is probably not the most efficient way of doing things. But I don't know. Juno doesn't take that much delta v to take off from, so、um, I don't think it matters a great deal. Now those、um, peripheral fuel tanks there are not connected to the central central core using fuel lines, but they are connected using decouplers that have、uh, crossfeed enabled. And when you set the tanks up like that, by default. The game will just set it so that the external tanks drain before the central course. It's like you have fuel lines there, but you don't. The game just sort of adds them, or you know, mimics them would probably be a, b- a better phrase there.、Uh, so yeah, so now I, when I deployed those peripheral tanks, we still had full fuel, so it was a really efficient, a really efficient setup. And、uh, yeah, we got a pretty pretty happy with that target. We unfortunately can't create a maneuver node because neither Kerbal on board is a pilot, so I'm just having to sort of play around with nodes on the. Now, we'll try and get the encounter as close as possible, and I think half a kilometer, not being four kilometers, is is pretty good going. So we'll just、uh, go for it there, burn retrograde to our target, and then just burn towards our target, and we should be on a zero kilometer separation、uh, relatively easily. So let's just burn towards the target now, and there we are, zero kilometer separation according to the.、Uh, The nodes on the map screens.、So、then we'll just time warp a little bit until we're nice and close, and then perform another burn. This time retrograde towards our target, get ourselves to zero meters per second relative to our target speed, or I guess in this case 0.1 meters per second. Hopefully, you know that's slow enough. We're not going to drift away anytime soon. Now we're just going to quickly gather the science from the、uh, science unit. So I did a crew report just then, so we can take the data from the lander can, and then we can take all the data from all of the experiment bays as well. Then we need to quickly get back on board the ship, run the experiments again, so we can get all the science from space near to Juno, which I didn't do before we did the descent, and then we can go out on EVA once again and take all of the data. So yeah, we are going to come up a little bit short of my initial hope, my, my initial plan of getting about 2,000 science because I forgot to get science from space high above Juno. I don't know if that would have got us quite to 2,000, but I know it's I know it works out to roughly 2,000. So because we've got two kerbals, we may as well do the lounge lazy method of docking. The way this works is you have a kerbal inside each vessel, and then set each vessel to target the other vessel's docking port, and then just use the Aim at target button on the nav ball, kind of auto SAS, and then just burn towards the target, and you'll see that you know the ships remain in alignment. They'll like automatically lock on, and it's dead easy. You don't need RCS. Hope that was a a good description. If not, hopefully the video told you what you needed to know. 
Now, I prematurely undocked the vessel here as I realized, like, oh yes, actually, I want to probably deorbit the lander so that it doesn't just get left stuck in low dunar orbit. So I quickly redocked with it. Uh, there we are. I'm going to quickly do a retrograde burn to, uh, you know, put ourselves on a suborbital trajectory. Undock the lander can. Oh, there it goes. And uh, then quickly burn prograde again. <laughs> Did a quick puff just there before the engine bell slammed into the side of the lander. And there it goes. Spinning into the distance. Kind of sad. It's doomed now. And look at that. We just about have a connection to the Kerbal Space Center, which means I can perform, I can create a maneuver node. I think maybe the next episode of The Stranded should be just me setting up a, uh, a relay network around Kerbin and the Mun and Minmus and all that, just so that we don't have to ever worry about not having a connection to the Kerbal Space Center, so that we can, you know, always make a maneuver node no matter what. Or I guess I could just, at the end of this episode, I can probably unlock like a bigger crew capsule and I can just ensure that we always have a pilot Kerbal with us. So it doesn't matter, because pilot Kerbals can always create maneuver nodes even without a connection to the Kerbal Space Center. It's just engineers and scientists can't and Matt Kerman is a scientist Kerbal. I set it like that so that he can restore the Science Junior and Mystery Goo. Only the scientists can use those experiments more than once. Now I retracted our solar panels and our antenna here just because I feel like it would be a bit more realistic. It re reduces the risk of them breaking under the g-forces of the burn from the engine. Uh, not a thing in Kerbal Space Program. You don't need to do that because that won't happen but I just feel like it looks looks a little bit more realistic. I don't know. Anyway, now we're doing the uh, the lounge lazy method of returning to Kerbin when you're not at a transfer window from wherever you are to Kerbin. Basically, just get yourself on a solar orbit so that your orbital line intersects Kerbin's at some point, and then just create a maneuver node shortly after that point at which you cross over Kerbin's orbit, and just drag on either prograde or retrograde, and you'll just see those grey markers swing around, and you'll get a really easy encounter after the next solar orbit that you do. So that's what I'm doing there. And that's a little tip in case you ever want to, you know, an easy way of getting back to Kerbin. It's not the most efficient. The most efficient way is to wait for a Juna to Kerbin transfer window, but uh, who's got time for that, you know? <laughs> and there we have it. We have a nice Kerbin encounter. I'm just going to Try and adjust it a tiny bit. Let's see, uh, 40, 40 kilometers, 41 kilometers. I'd say that's pretty good. Probably want it a tiny bit lower, but what we'll do is we'll just wait until we're actually in Kerbin's sphere of influence and then just uh, then just perform a radial burn and just lower our periapsis that way. It costs a little bit more delta V, but we've got 255 meters per second remaining, uh, of fuel remaining, so we've easily got enough fuel to do this. So there we go. We're going to just point radially in. I'm just going to watch our periapsis level. Uh, it's at the top left of the screen. Uh, yeah, 20.4 kilometers. I'd say that's a pretty safe altitude. We're definitely going to be capturing a Kerbin. And I'm going to do a couple at the last second just so we can watch a nice firework display during the, uh, during the aero capture. And look at those flames licking the sides of the capsule there. So, yeah, where should we go next episode? I wonder, I wonder where it will be. Let, let me know your thoughts down below. Where should I go? Where do you think I will go? You guys know what I'm asking, right? <laughs> Well, the parachutes have deployed. I can see the ground appearing before us. So, Nate, uh, thank you for flying Laon Aerospace. How did you did you enjoy the flight? Are we talking again now? Oh, I see. We're still on the whole Among Us thing. Are... You know, we've been in flight for like two years now. I was hoping we could have maybe moved past this. I, I don't know, man. I mean, I'm excited to be back home, but uh, I, I'm going to need you to take that back, or, or we can't be friends anymore. I mean, I just still need an answer. The people will need to know. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, are, can you just fly me back to Duna then? <sighs> I see. You're a, you're an enigma, Nate. You're an enigma. Is there any closing thoughts that you want to share with the community, though, Nate? Like, putting our beef aside. <laughs> our beef. Uh, actually, I don't think I, I... I don't really need to promote KSP2 a whole lot, so... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm speaking to you. Well, I mean, Matt, now it's up for debate capacity. if it's going to be better than Among Us, you know. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> that is true. Hey, I think the best way to resolve this question of KSP2 versus Among Us is uh, play KSP2. Let me know what you think. That's um, a good way to end.